before when they started with the scholarship rule, you take 150 guys to camp. I had like a 3,000 square foot weight room at the University of Pittsburgh in the back of the locker room. I just had to schedule guys all throughout the day. You're responsible over 100 guys. And even back then I knew you can't train everybody the same. There's different qualities or hierarchy of qualities that each position needs. And I realized that one day sitting in a staff meeting with, with Coach Sherrill, and Coach Sherrill asked Coach Moore, or asked me, he goes, how's he doing in the weight room? I said, getting stronger. He says, he looked at our offensive line coach, the late Joe Moore, he says, how's he doing? He says, stinks. Ain't doing it, ain't any better. I'm not, right then I realized, it ain't all about strength. There's a lot of other things that I can help these guys put in place to help them improve their performance on the field. So, um, yeah, I realized that a long time ago. You can't train everybody the same. And everybody has these hierarchical qualities that needed to be addressed. And that's why I've never written the same program for everybody. And I never will. But uh, I forget what I was talking about. Shit. That's what happens when you get older. You said you were talking about the 150 athletes and you were bringing them in um, often during... Oh, yeah. So I, I went back to pick a 97. I had my first assistant, Mark Costick. And Mark goes to me, you know who Louis Simmons is? And I'm like, no. I really don't. I don't pay attention to powerlifting. You know, I was just bodybuilding and working in a rehab clinic. So he gave me a couple articles. I'm like, oh, this guy's pretty fucking good. I wonder if we can get him out of here. So I called, and Louie talked to me, and I started talking to Dave Tate. You know, Louie never left Columbus, Ohio, very solemnly. Really? So Dave Tate convinces, convinces Louie to come to Pitt for a day. For three hours, I got my ass ripped. Uh... <laughs> And I'm like, oh boy. And what was surprising to me was, is I'm walking out the door and Dave grabs my arm and says, don't worry about it, he likes you. So I said, Louie, I need to understand where you came from. And he sent me all his articles from Pilot in USA. I bought the book, Science and Practice of Strength Training, that, uh, book. Great book. And book. I went to visit, I called Penn State University. I remember I'm from Pitt, my mm -hmm. hard blue and gold. Mm -hmm. For me to walk on a state campus is pure blasphemy. <laughs> uh, it doesn't, it, it can't happen, but it did. So I called and got in touch with Dr. Zatzorski, and a couple of weeks later, myself and Chad Hutzko, I went on back to Pitt. We're traveling to Penn State to meet Dr. Zatzorski, which is where I really first heard about force plates and what he was doing in his biomechanics lab. So that, that was 97? That was 97. That changed my life meeting Louie. And from Louie, the next thing I know, Tommy Myzinski and I are traveling, are traveling out to Westside, Columbus, Ohio to visit Louie because he invited us out. First day we, we go into Westside, and it's the old Westside, which is on Demarose Road. I'm watching Chuck Vogelpool do a seat of good mornings with 500 pounds for 10 reps. And I turn to Tommy, I'm like, oh, we're in a different fucking world. I don't know yeah. who, I'm fucking, I'm just going to keep my mouth shut. Kenny Patterson's laying up doing dumbbell tricep extensions with fucking 100 pound dumbbells. And I'm like, holy fuck, is this a whole new world. But from Louie, I got, I got to meet Charlie Francis and started talking to Charlie. I have a notebook at home. I don't know where it is. Every conversation I ever had with Charlie is in that book. I still have his speed trap and his uh, speed training book here with his personal cell phone in it. You better so go find that book. I still have it. Sorry. Now, the other one, the other one is, I think it's my mother's house. Yeah, I stored in um, in our garage here in a, in a couple of boxes. I don't have all my books in this room, but those guys changed my life. Uh, I went to the 97, I went to the Mega Power Conference in Cleveland, Ohio, and it was Louis Simmons and Charles Pollock. There was maybe 50 people in, in attendance. There was myself, my assistant, Mark Costick, a good friend of mine who I'm very close with, Michael Hope, who's a PT, who's one of my go-to guys when I got issues or I call. Uh, in the center, there was one other strength coach there. It was Mike Mondi, who was a BC at the time. So there was three strength coaches. Everybody else was just personal trainers. That's all it was. And I learned more in those two fucking days. Well, I think it was one day that I've ever learned in my entire life. And that's why I started going back and forth visiting Westside. So I started reading all of Charlie's stuff. So I started calling and asking Charlie questions. Those people opened up my eyes. And that's when I started reading more and more and realized what I do realize, I realize the extensiveness of what I don't know. And when we talk about training, it's just not about the musculoskeletal system. It's about multiple systems and how they support each other and how they handle the stresses of training. It's more about the endocrine response and the hormonal response that we're all after. 
but there's so much more to know. It's not even funny, Justin. And there's times that I do get overwhelmed, especially now with all the data you collect. You can either be data driven or data aware. I'm aware of the data. Quick break from the show to remind you to hit that like and subscribe button. It helps us out and it helps you be notified when we have new content get released. So again, please hit that like and subscribe button if you enjoy this content. And with that, let's get back to the show. I'm not driven by it. It's not gonna happen. Like I look at it every fucking day. But I do look at you know the videos we take of players and it's constant problem solving. You have to, each, each athlete is a puzzle you have to solve. And I don't think anybody really has the answers. I know there's a lot of people out there who think they have the answers, but then you start dealing with individuals, you know, that doesn't apply to this guy. No, it really doesn't. I went, first time I, when I first came out here, Stu McMillan always talks about, I was over at Altus as much as I was in the Arizona Cardinals facility. And yeah. I have a little notebook. And I took a thousand notes watching those guys coach. The first thing I noticed about Dan is he's a great problem solver and he's a great observationist. He saw things I couldn't see. And I was like, Jesus, I got a lot of... I went to dinner one night with Carlo, <laughs> Carlo Boscelli, Dan, Klein Monsinski, and myself. I didn't eat. I just took fucking notes. I didn't say a word. I didn't say a word for two hours. I just sat there and wrote, I said, can you repeat that again? Can you, one, one more time? What was that again? I was just writing shit in a book. And I still refer to that, uh, that book when I go home sometimes. You'll get up in the middle of the night and I have post-it notes by my by the bed, my wife will tell you, I have post-it notes everywhere. Because you may get an idea, and at my age, you don't want to lose it. Trust me. What does that mean about me, then, if I got this? Yeah, 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 here they are. When it comes, it comes quick, and it doesn't stay that long. No. Constantly writing notes down in books. I have notebooks on my fucking desk here. They're all full with notes. I'm listening to podcasts. I take notes what people say. I'm like, and it, what irritates me really irritates me is when I don't know it. I'm like, how come he knows that and I don't? And then I get pissed at myself. So then I gotta go start going back through things and looking through things over and over again. <laughs> now I look at, I think I went, I spoke at the National Hockey League's convention, to, I think it was last year or the year before. It was Marco out in Florida. And I got to meet a guy who I have a lot of a tremendous respect for. I was following him for months, Les Spellman. And as Les speaking, mm -hmm. was like, why the fuck don't I know this? So I started calling Les. Les and uh, Cece sat in my office one day, and I'm like, these guys are on a new level. They're on another level that I have to get to. So, you know, every day is a challenge, I think should be a challenge for all of us in physical preparation, is just to be better than what you were the day before. Find one, one thing that you didn't know, and look at everything that you're 100% certain of, and question it. Go back and question it. When you're certain of something, I always go back. It's like Mark Twain said, once I find myself on the side of the vast majority, it's time to take a step back and reflect. And that's what I've been able to do my entire career. Is take a step. I'm, I'm, I'm trusting, I'm my worst critic. I'm constantly writing notes to myself, constantly thinking, why didn't I know that? And then I gotta go back and start researching things. I was doing that before you called me. I'm like, fuck, I didn't know that. I better find out why I didn't know that. And I'll go back and reread re things. In my age, a lot of guys I know my age just kind of sliding off into the into the sunset. I'm not going to do that. I wasn't. That's my my responsibility is to do the best I can for the athletes I'm responsible for. So I'm constantly trying to upgrade my knowledge because your athletes are your responsibility. You limit your you limit your knowledge, you limit your abilities, limit your abilities, and limit the development of your athletes. So what's your job? Develop your athletes. But the, the, the data stuff, don't get me wrong, it drives me nuts sometimes. It becomes Same. overwhelming. Oh my gosh. It becomes too fucking overwhelming for me and I gotta so take much. a step back. Yeah, I gotta take a step back. I'm like, leave me alone with that shit. I don't wanna see it today. I've already my mind is already working overtime. I don't wanna fucking see it right now. <laughs> I took they did Kyler Murray's uh force play yesterday. I waited till this morning to look at it. I'm like, I'm not ready for this yet. I'm not ready for it. I watched him jump. I saw, I saw him slingshot, I saw some things. I saw his first jump, he bent more at the waist so he recruited from his lower back when he jumped. Uh, back extension, I'm like, I'm not ready for everything else yet. I just got it, I just started looking at it today. And what I do, I put it in a fucking folder and send it up to Matt Jordan. He say, Matt, 
I'll pay you for this, but yeah, need some good help here. So I'm waiting to hear back from Matt. <laughs> Taking a quick break from the show to talk to you guys about our sponsor, Team Builder. If you have any online training platform needs, Team Builder is the go to place. Team Builder has the ability to integrate with velocity based training tools. They have the ability to program and have notes and videos for all of your athletes and your clients. This is your number one stop shop. Been using it since 2019 when I was working at Towson. So I've used it, love it. Make sure you check it out. Go ahead, click the link down in the description. And with that, let's get back to the show. <laughs> there, that is, that is what Dango good. said you used to do that to him too though like if he'd ask you a question be like ah not today yet motherfucker like yeah exactly I was saying I'm not ready for that fucking yet my mind doesn't work I would tell him that yeah I'm not ready for that don't ask him that question or if you're going to ask me don't expect an immediate response you have to give me time to think about it and there's a lot of shit in his brain after 66 years and 43 being involved in his profession sometimes somebody mm. will say something go, oh yeah we did that back in like 1980. We were doing that. It's like when I first, people started talking about med balls. I'm like, yeah, I had med balls at Pitt. In 1980, we should throw them around. They were the leather ones. Remember the old leather ones? We had the old leather had med balls. We had them in the weight room. So that guy sort them back and forth. Try and knock the guy over with it. Try and throw it through his chest. But we started Now that's med- like the new cool thing to do. <clears throat> no, no. Yeah, there's, like I said, anything new is old. There's nothing out there that I haven't seen. The only thing I haven't seen is all this data nonsense. And that is the thing. It is nonsense because you can become overwhelmed. It, it, it kind of can oversaturate it. I feel like it's the pendulum is eventually going to swing back the other way where people get rid of it. Do you agree or no? Is it here to stay? Um, I think it's here to stay, to be honest with you. So like old, old guys like me just have to deal with it. I can look at a guy right now knowing I don't, I don't need to jump in, I know he's gassed. I can just watch him. My first assessment is when guys come in and they start doing tissue prep, they're using a foam roller as a pillow. Or they're just laying at you and looking at you with dead eyes and you turn the music on and nothing happens. Yeah, they're You better gassed. be prepared to change. Just because it's on paper doesn't mean it needs to be done. There's always, the, there's three opinions. There's the opinion of the athlete there's the opinion of the coach, and the athlete always has perceptual awareness, not physiological readiness, or perceptual readiness, not physiological readiness. They know their perceptual readiness and what they perceive to be the readiness. Because you always get guys say, oh, I feel good, I feel good. I'm like, really? Because you look like shit. And the last is the opinion of the athlete's body. Who are you going to listen to? The athlete's body will talk to you as they move. The question now becomes, am I listening? Is it really a dysfunctional movement pattern, or is it just what he does? Andre de Grasse, that left arm goes straight when he sprints. I was talking to Chidi a couple of weeks ago, and I always have these, Chidi always makes me aware of a lot of things, but he was talking about uh, Shelly Fraser Price. Uh, and he says when she first came, she was smoking everybody, but she had a forward head lean, she had big backside mechanics, and over time, she cleaned it up. But he goes, you can still look across the track to this day and say, that's Shelly Ann Fraser Price. I know how she moves. Because people are gonna move distinctly to what works for them. There's the model. We all work to the model, but there's also bandwidth. Congratulations on making it to the end of the video. Why don't you celebrate by watching more videos just like it? You can also help us on our quest to placate the algorithm gods by liking, sharing, subscribing, and commenting. Thank you.